Welcome to the New Books Network. This is Lily Gorn with the New Books Network, the New Books and Political Science podcast. Today I'm joined by Aaron Mayo Adam, who's the author of Queer Alliances How Power Shapes Political Movement Formation. This book was published in 2020 by Stanford University Press. And it's a really interesting exploration into our understanding of political and social movements, who participates in them, how they engage, um, and and to some degree, where and how they operate, um, both legally and socially. So I'm going to let Erin tell us all about that. First, I'd like to welcome Erin to the podcast and ask her to tell us a little bit about herself and how she came to this project. Hi, Erin. Hi, Lily. Uh, First, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be able to talk with you and everyone listening about my book. Um, I I suppose um, I am an assistant professor of political science at Hunter College CUNY uh, in New York City, and um, I specialize in uh, law and society studies, specifically law and social movements. And I'm really just fascinated as a scholar by grassroots activism and how understandings of uh, uh, grassroots understandings of rights are implicated in movements for uh, social change, uh, not just rights as constructed by legal scholars or uh, Supreme Court justices, but by how people on the ground um, uh, organize around rights and think through their own understandings of rights. Um, and that scholarly fascination um, draw, drew me, I suppose, um, to uh, graduate school and um, Ultimately, I settled on this project uh, mo- partially because of my own personal background with the two movements that are at the center of the study. Well, three um, LGBTQ immigrant and labor movement uh, movements. So the um, really what happened um, uh, this this project grew out of my graduate school dissertation. I ended up going to graduate school uh, largely because of. Um, my experience with Proposition 8 in California in 2008, I um, was living in a very conservative area of California. Uh, I wasn't out at the time. And it was just a really big shock, I think, for a lot of people in my generation that that Proposition 1, uh, Proposition 8, of course, is um, uh, a ban, same-sex marriage in California. And it it was also just very viscerally personal because it was like in the neighborhood I lived at, it was everyone in the community supported it. All of my neighbors, there were signs everywhere. There was huge protests in support of Proposition 8. Uh, And I think it's not only myself, but other scholars I know that came out of California from that time period, that moment really, I think, activated them and has been sort of this driving force behind their own uh, research, especially those who identify as LGBTQ. I identify as LGBTQ. Um, so that really drove me to go to graduate school and study the LGBTQ rights movement. I wanted to know why this happened. And um, I did graduate school and law school concurrently. And as part of my um, uh, law school experience, I worked as a, a clerk with a civil rights law firm on immigration rights cases in Washington State. And one of the organizations I worked with um, was involved with challenging a case along the border, dealing with uh, 911 dispatchers who were run by the the Border Patrol, uh, which, of course, essentially terrorized the entire uh, Latino community along uh, the Washington State-Canadian border. Um, And so I was trying to challenge that. And in the process, I got to know a lot of immigrant rights organizations. And one of the things that really struck me with that was that um, unlike in California, where it was pretty clear that there was no or very little community of color outreach, as I was working with these immigrant rights organizations, it was apparent that they had pretty good relationships with all of the local LGBTQ organizations. In Washington State at the time, they were building, starting to build up for the Referendum 74 campaign for same-sex marriage, and uh, a lot of the organizations were fully supportive of them. And so um, my... Um, that led me to this puzzle. Why is it in the past you didn't see these alliances occur? And, and why is, are we seeing them now in Washington state? And so ultimately that got me to the project. Um, and it was, uh, so I, it, it also uh, was how I had connections with the organizations in Washington state. Uh, 
I ultimately also settled on uh, Arizona as my other case study because Arizona um, was, um, I was looking for uh, extreme cases, one that um, has a more uh, hit, uh, uh, progressive history when it comes to LGBTQ and immigrant rights and one that had a less progressive history. And Arizona was a very um, good example of that they also had similar coalitions in the state of Arizona. And um, they um, uh, that uh, had, for example, SB 1070, uh, a ban on same sex marriage go in. And it was also the one where funding was was easiest for me to do the project for looking to the two extreme cases. And at the same time, I was very involved with my graduate student labor union. So I was connected to the labor community. So I was aware that the labor movement was very involved with the coalition. So that this really sort of drove why I, I focus on this particular um, coalition of uh, groups uh, in um, the two state contexts. And and that's one of the things that I thought was really interesting is you really are pulling together places and groups and 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 activist activism, excuse me, that are not necessarily usually put together um, or certainly not put together in the sort of three pronged way that you did. Immigrants and labor is often seen together, but the LGBTQ component is not usually part of that conversation. Um, so I was intrigued by that. I also wanted to ask you a little bit about sort of the broad concepts that we're talking about here. You are definitely expert in sort of thinking about um, political movements um, slash social movements. Um, but can you talk a little bit in a sort of definitional way about this kind of activism and what you also start to call inter and intra movement dynamics? Yeah, so uh, there's a couple of major interventions that the book makes. And one of them is this argument that we we shouldn't think of political movements anymore as single identity movements that exist mostly at the national level. Uh, when we think of movements, at least as they're forming, we should think of them as coalitions of different groups uh, at the local level. And to explain that, I use the term inter and intra movement coalitions or the phrase inter and intra movement coalitions, uh, because what that is designed to do is to show not only how coalitions are created ac across different uh, uh, minority communities or different uh, social movement communities, but also within them as well, um, especially uh, because that's where a lot of the, I suppose, long term building needs to be conducted in order to create a coalition that will last beyond the lifespan of a singular rights campaign or moment, a single win or a single loss. Um, so um, that's, I suppose, specifically when I'm talking about inter and intra movement coalitions, uh, just looking at the LGBTQ uh, movement, for example, the intra coalition or within coalition would be between um, uh, mainstream LGBTQ groups, uh, queer and trans groups, and undocumented uh, and queering trans groups within those, right? Uh, you have these sort of mainstream and marginalized movements within uh, a movement. And then inter would be between the LGBTQ movement and the immigrant rights movement, right? Uh, and I have a, a nice chart in the book that explains this as well. Um, so it's, it's coalitions within coalitions. And feel free to ask me for clarification if that didn't make sense. I usually have the chart in front of me when I explain that. So I'm trying to picture the chart as I'm explaining it. No, I mean, and, and I think the charts inside the book, you do a number of, have a number of charts that are useful in terms of visualizing some of these dynamics that you're talking about because they are multi-layered. And so for a reader to sort of tease out and understand the various layers, the the, I understand what you're saying about the charts, and they are very useful. Um, but we are a podcast, right. so <laughs> we don't have visual aids. Um, but but the, your your explanation of sort of understanding the coalitions themselves, and then the sort of inter and intra movement dynamics, I think, is really important to understanding the sort of broader discussion, which is about you know how do these movements and coalitions come together. And what are they advocating for? And how are they supporting each other? 
um, which I think is really the backbone of your work. Can you talk about, you know, why and how you put these groups together because you saw them interacting um, in your research? Um, yeah. Um, so um, I came to the puzzle, um, uh, of course, as I described earlier, based on the uh, my own uh, experiences with the different political movements. Uh, and then when I was conducting my research, um, I ended up um, using, I'm part of a scholarly community that's um, uh, interpretivist and qualitative uh, multi-methodological. Uh, and as part of that uh, uh, scholarly community, I uh, was interested in conducting a study that um, uh, really centered the activists themselves and that also made sure that I was giving back to the communities or at least um, not exploiting the communities as I was conducting research within them. Uh, so my research had uh, consisted predominantly of in-depth interviews with the different uh, social movement actors, but it also had a really significant participant observation component where I would volunteer long-term with um, many of the organizations in the study. Uh, and um, in some cases, I volunteered for three months with or an organization um, before I got a single interview. Um, a lot of that is about gaining access to the organizations, but it's also about um, gaining trust with the organization so they feel comfortable telling you their story that you're not going to uh, misrepresent it, I suppose, as you um, write up the research, right? Um, so um, that's sort of how I conducted the research on the ground. I had two main groups of uh, individuals I interviewed, um, uh, advocates and organization leaders. Advocates were usually, they're generally people that held um, high uh, membership roles with organizations or leadership roles, but they didn't feel comfortable speaking on an organization's behalf. And advocates could also be politicians. I had some big politicians I spoke with as well. So that was just the, the how I conducted the research on the ground. And I um, did a variety of things with outreach in order to connect with people from the big cross-section of the uh, coalition, I um, or the different coalitions. I, um, in addition to my own contacts, I did a lot of uh, prior research looking for how organizations were mentioned in news media and in uh, media advertisements to identify key players. And then I used that to do a snowball sampling technique where I would reach out to people, conduct an interview, and then ask them if they thought uh, anyone else, they knew of anyone else who would be interested in speaking with me about um, uh, their political activism. Um, so that's sort of the how of the, uh, I, I conducted the study. And in terms of um, the study itself, because you talk about the fact that what you're doing comes out of the political science and law sort of s s theoretical framework, but that a lot of what you're doing is also sociological and historical. So not only is your research multidimensional in terms of what you're looking at, but also the framework and the methods that you use are coming out of a variety of disciplines. Did this make you insane at any point? <laughs> <laughs> it was, um, you know, um, I, I really have to hand it to my mentors because it, it, it didn't, mostly because I was really connected to the story of the coalition's and I thought of that story first, um, and then um, eventually um, I sort of mapped it on to other scholarship I was also engaged in uh, and illustrated. And I think that's one of the unique contributions of, of the book is when we look at um, research within marginalized communities, um, we want to ensure that we are adequately representing their own personal narratives and not just trying to map them on to um, theories and ideologies in ways that don't necessarily connect. And I think that's why uh, my book ends up creating new theories and new ideas that don't previously exist, because these are from the interviewees themselves or from the activists I was, I was engaging with, um, if that makes sense. Yep. And, and one of the 
part points that you make early. And I think this is in the introduction, and then you talk about it a little bit more. And I think you sort of sort of um, outlined it a little bit, but you didn't use the the term that you use in the book, which is queer methodology. Um, and I think this also goes to, as you say, some of the new ideas and new theories with regard to um, the research itself. Can you talk a little bit about what that means in terms of our understanding of, say, social science research methods, but also how it worked inside of your own research? Yeah. Um, well, then that, that's just such an excellent question as well. But, uh, I mean, it really, and I'm so happy you got that from the book because I was hoping people would, um, because I didn't feel like I emphasized it as much as I could have. And I went back to make sure that I did. So yeah, it really, uh, one of the big things was focusing on formation of movements, right? Uh, and looking at how uh, the formation process works and discovering um, how that works versus focusing on success and outcome, which a lot of political movement studies do. Because when you look at success and outcome, you really tend to leave out marginalized populations, which generally don't have um, uh, as great big splashes or successes uh, as um, less marginalized populations. Um, and um, I, I think in that way, I was really trying to just destabilize our understanding of political movements. Let's look at political movements through this, this lens of formation. And let's look at them in ways that don't encompass just one single identity community, but a multiplicity of communities. Uh, because political movements, they're very rarely about, you don't win a political movement just by mobilizing one community, right? You win a political movement or you win uh, uh, moments with, uh, within that movement by mobilizing across a multiplicity of communities. Uh, and it's not also, I suppose win is the wrong word. A lot of times I use the term advance because it's, it's about struggling through a um, series of advances. And these advances, they can be a big moment like same-sex marriage, winning same-sex marriage, or a very small one like uh, getting uh, a seat on a city council, which I, I, even as I say that, I have a hard time seeing that as small because there was so much effort that went into, the, into that seat when it was won, it, um, it, when I was interviewed, when I conducted my research, right? They, and they're, they're really big wins that we, when we think of them at, with only the, the national level, you don't really see them. And but you do see them, as you're saying, that there are there are a variety of different, as you say, advances. And and I also found it really fascinating the way you set up a kind of juxtaposition by looking at the um, the advocacy and ultimately the passage of a variety of anti progressive legislation in Arizona and Washington state, and how that prompted what we often think of as a backlash. Um, that also contributed to sort of pulling these various groups together into a coalition. And I'd love for you to be sort of tease out how your research sort of found these, um, these, these particular pieces of legislation that were limiting people's rights and freedoms um, in Arizona and Washington state and, and what the response was in regard to sort of evolving coalitions around changing those. Yeah. So why don't I focus on, um, I feel like I've been sort of too abstract. So why don't I just focus, focus on specific coalitions. So let's look at uh, the Arizona case, for example. When I went to Arizona and I talked with interviewees, I really wanted them to tell me their own advocacy story, their own activism story. And as they were telling me their story, I, when I would later in, go back and look at their stories, I would look for uh, it using qualitative research so software similarities across the interviews. And one of the big similarities in uh, the interviews was the importance of SB 1070 as an activism uh, moment. SB 1070 was a virulently anti-immigrant uh, item of legislation. It was an omnibus anti-immigrant bill uh, that, among other things, uh, increased racial profiling uh, of people of color in the state of Arizona uh, because it... Um, enabled law enforcement to stop and question those who they suspected were undocumented during just routine uh, traffic stops. And this item of legislation dramatically changed the lives of a lot of people in my study 
as a result of that, they became activated and they just want, they felt that they needed to do that in order to survive, in order to sh- ensure that they could um, stay where they were in their communities. Uh, and in response to that, they decided that they would form uh, a civic engagement coalition that would um, do multiple things. On the ground, it would um, uh, register voters, get out the vote, try to flip city council seats and local elections uh, for candidates who were in support of policies that the coalition supported. And then after that, they would push their own uh, policy in order to ensure uh, that their policy initiatives were being represented uh, once they uh, shifted uh, the dynamics of the the politics of the state. And I think that's a also a really fascinating case because you really see how that grows all the way through 2020 when ultimately that coalition, I think, played a key role in uh, the 2020 presidential election. Yeah, I just, as you were just saying that, I was like, oh, sure, I see the through line. <laughs> um, and, and so SB 1070, as you said, was this sort of omnibus legislation that it impacted people's lives. And, and you sort of go through step by step in terms of many of the ways that um, the efforts were made to roll back, roll back or defeat or redo or reform dimensions of that. Can you talk about how the coalition itself worked in terms of not just the sort of civic engagement and get out the vote and the policy advocacy, but what went in, what went on inside the coalition itself? Yeah. So I identify, um, thank you so much for that question. Yeah. I identify three uh, main factors in my um, interviews that uh, helped actually form the coalition. Uh, The three main ones are, um, uh, they identified, uh, they, they helped form the coalition by identifying s- a specific common opponents or common enemies or uh, and or shared uh, collective fears. And then they helped, they also, um, in through having conversations with one another and deciding to work together in a coalition, uh, they constructed a common social movement task. So what do I, I mean by uh, common enemies? So for example, in uh, Arizona, uh, the some of the main architects behind SB 1070 were uh, a a legislator by the name of Russell Pierce. And Russell Pierce worked with a number of individuals in the state as well who were highly anti-LGBTQ. And so that particular opponent really illustrated how the LGBTQ community was connected to the immigrant rights community, right? Uh, And in addition, uh, the communities themselves also, as they, uh, Talked, th- talked with one another and came to the decision to form a coalition and a coalition that grew over time, uh, they um, constructed a shared social movement past. And that um, was uh, constructed based on similar experiences of attacks across their communities and also similar experiences of, um, I suppose, um, uh, rights experiences, right? Civil rights experiences. Um if, if that makes sense. When you say civil rights experiences, what are you talking about in that regard? Um, yeah, so it would be, I suppose, um, they would see themselves as part of, of the same overarching civil rights movement uh, and an overarching struggle for social change. Um, so probably the best example of this is in Washington state uh, where I had interviewees connect uh, same-sex marriage to um, the movement to undo uh, 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 bans on interracial marriage, right? Uh, so then when in my interview, uh, my interviews, I uh, interviewed some individuals who were part of the Japanese American community and really um, re- recalled, um, uh, and these were uh, individuals who were older, uh, they recalled um, uh, just how um, crucial that ban was on their own uh, formative experiences, the ban on interracial marriage. And then they connected that to the ban on same-sex marriage and saw that as part of the same overarching social movement. Uh, So that is one example of how um, they would create similar, uh, I I suppose, civil rights uh, narratives. The civil rights narratives are something that you also talk about in terms of how 
how we, I'm going to talk about myself as an outsider. Um, we as outsiders look at some of these movements. And as you note throughout the book, and as you know, sort of, there's a lot of now study of this, um, the issue of same sex marriage is fairly narrow. I mean, it's broad because it's a bunch of rights, but within the LGBTQ community, it is one piece. Um, and can you talk about how this particular narrative, while it fits into our understanding of civil rights and equal access, it's still not, um, it's like the tip of the iceberg. Um, and your, ta- your discussion in the book really clarified a lot of that to me in terms of how people in the coalition sort of saw some of this advocacy with regard to same-sex marriage but not sort of the rights of other people in the LGBTQ community. Yeah. It, the One of the other contributions of the book is something about, it, I, I call it, what contributes to social movement expansion and what contributes to social movement contraction? Because sometimes what you would see with these coalitions, and this was especially true in Washington state, is in the aftermath of a big rights win, like the win of same-sex marriage, you would see a lot of fissures within the coalition and fracture points that made it difficult for movement actors to continue working together afterwards. And a lot of that happened because of how same-sex marriage was centered within uh, uh, the Referendum 74 campaign, for example. Uh, And um, it was pushed at the time uh, by many of the advocates uh, as uh, we're going to win this first, and then we're going to move on to other issues that really matter to Um, other parts of the LGBTQ community, like, for example, uh, police brutality, um, which is a really big concern, especially for trans uh, women of color. Um, uh, Healthcare access, which is a a massive concern for all who are members of the trans community and queer communities. Uh, But after same-sex marriage occurred, you saw a lot of organizations just start to fissure. So my my book also... um, highlights those things that lead to coalition contraction. And and one of these things is uh, centering money and power is what I call it. So centering more of these mainstream groups, which are groups that are, um, I suppose, um, not um, as marginalized as other groups within the intra-movement coalition. So for example, uh, lesbian and and gay men who maybe are only concerned with same-sex marriage versus um, a trans and queer people who are also just concerned with basic shelter, healthcare, uh, uh, housing rights, right? Um, and um, another thing is through tokenization. So as they formed a coalition that include, included a multiplicity of different communities, in order to illustrate that, they would often forefront the more marginalized members of the community, uh, but in ways that didn't actually alter the organization uh, missions of the individual organizations that were within the community, which led to a lot of those within uh, the this particular campaign feeling uh, as if they'd been exploited by the campaign. Uh, and so this became a problem in the aftermath of the campaign that then the communities themselves had to overcome as new issues arose. For example, when the anti-trans bills came up in uh, 2016, which I talk about a little bit at the end of the book, uh, which gets into some of the things that the, the uh, coalitions then worked on in order to try to combat these uh, contraction tendencies. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, and it's part of what you talk about in terms of radical issues versus mainstream issues, which I also found to be a really interesting way to sort of think about what it is you're talking about with regard to the various members of the different the different coalitions that come together. Um, and so when you're talking about immigrant rights, there's mainstream issues with regard to, you know, sort of having the freedom to walk down the street and not have police ask you for your papers, but there are also radical dimensions with regard to access to school or healthcare or other areas. And you, you sort of tease these out. Can you talk, I mean, this, I think it follows directly from what you were talking about in terms of understanding the coalitions with regard to the mainstream issues, as you say, and also the more radical issues. Yeah. So um, you mean um, how they, worked through those in the coalition? Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, um, I suppose in order to um, explain this, I I need to explain the concept of rights episodes, which is another concept I, I, I ask use. you next, but go for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that's really how um, they were able to work through what I identified as essentially massive political differences between groups within the coalitions, right? So rights episodes um, are essentially, essentially they're intense advocacy moments around a particular, a, a, a big rights win or a big rights loss. And they become so all encompassing that they draw in all of the groups um, that are in the, the local area. And by draw them in, they, they have to join the, the, um, the, the moment, the episodic moment in order to be relevant in the um, uh, po- po- political movement as it's moving forward. Uh, and so when people join it, they, 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 and become part of this episode, um, they um, have different ways they'll, they'll intervene in it. Some will be part of it because maybe they believe wholeheartedly in the right at issue and they want to ensure that it will win. Others might join it, not necessarily because they think the right at issue is the most important right or the one that should be forefronted, but because they want to form relationships with those who are part of the movement. Um, and th- those uh, relationships um, hopefully then can carry on b- beyond the, mo- the moment. Although, as I explained, there can also be contraction things that can tear away at that. So, um, what I found in the book is when you're talking about offensive rights, like same-sex marriage, um, you tend to see um, uh, a lot less expansion over time uh, versus uh, when you're ha- dealing with a defensive right, like SB 1070, right, uh, where um, you don't just have the lifespan of that singular campaign, but you have that moment continuing over a longer period of time. So I suppose one of the ways in which they were supposed to, they were able to work through these big political differences is because of the episodes themselves, right? And I think that's sort of illustrated the interviewees, uh, when I identified this, uh, the rights episode concept, I identified it because the interviewees would all use similar language to um, uh, talk about it. They would talk about rights episodes as fires or explosions or vortexes, or my, my favorite analogy, someone talked about it as a, a neutron star, which are these big burning bright forces that are, uh, I suppose, uh, extraordinary at the same time they're terrible, right? Um, and that isn't how a lot of the political movement literature talks about these moments. They talk about them as opportunities, right? They don't talk about how they also have these um, uh, uh, explosive, terrible aspects to them as well, right? And and that's one of the things that I thought was really interesting because as I was reading the book and you talk about this idea of rights episodes, and this goes to some, you know, there's a lot of discussion of time these days in political theory in lots of different places. And what you're talking about is the way that we often think about the social movements as this kind of linear experience, right? Um, there's advocacy for change and the change happens um, and then everybody celebrates and goes about their business. Um, and it's kind of like ends. And and what you're talking about is that it doesn't really end, but that there are different ways in which the sort of episodes evolve and devolve and, and shift also in terms of the coalition. And I'm wondering if there is a way that we are so used to thinking about time in this linear way that it it's, you know, your your analysis is asking us to sort of stand in our heads in terms of thinking about rights movements. Yeah, it's definitely not trying to get it. It's definitely challenging the linear way of thinking about political movements, I would say, um, because it, it the movements themselves in, in this book, they're not, they're not moving forward towards progress. They're, they're constantly engaged in the struggle. That would be how the interviewees would describe it. Um, and it's part of their positionality, their subject positions, uh, based on their own, uh, the own minoritized place they are, they role they have in a hierarchical society, right? So it's a lot of, it's about 
power, right? And how power sort of forces you to be in this constant place of struggle in order to survive a lot of times. Uh, And I think that's especially, it's not as obvious, I think, with the same-sex marriage case, unless you include the more marginalized communities who um, you see continuing in the struggle in the aftermath of same-sex marriage. But it is a lot more obvious, I think, in the immigration rights case where the struggle is something indeed that has only um, gotten more intense, right, since my study ended. My study ended uh, in uh, 2016. Um, So on the verge of the presidential election, uh, which is when, of course, you see immigration becoming um, uh, this issue of even larger importance in the United States politics. And and I wanted to ask you also in this sort of rethinking how we think about um, sort of political movements and alliances, you also talk about political opportunity structures um, as one of the places where we need to consider how these, you know, sort of rights episodes um, evolve and and move and mutate. Can you talk about what the political opportunity structures are and how that works as you are exploring this research? Yeah. So uh, political opportunity structures is a concept that comes from political movement theory. And it's um, uh, generally used to uh, describe, um, it, it's kind of um, an amorphous term that actually scholars use in a variety of different ways. Uh, but the way I use it in my book is to uh, describe um, uh, particular moments when they arise that um, offer, I suppose, an opportunity for um, uh, a coalition or a new shift in the coalition uh, that might op- allow for an opportunity for change. But then I actually, uh, in the book, think of rights episodes as this sort of variant way of thinking about political opportunity structures that also includes not only thinking of them as opportunities, but moments that have these contraction things to them as well, right? These things that can ultimately destroy the coalition in the aftermath of a campaign, right? Um, So when I think of political opportunity structures, I think of them in more complex ways, I think, than you often see the political movements uh, literature think of them. I think of them as... um, uh, moments where um, uh, a collective of individuals can come together to accomplish change, but that moment itself can also lead to the retrenchment of hierarchical power, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah. And and I, I guess that's what I found really interesting about the research itself is that you are sort of talking about, as, and again, this is, you know, sort of our, our narrative experience or understanding of social movements or civil, civic rights civil rights movements is that the the civil right that is desired is achieved and everybody is happy according to all the movies right um <laughs> that's gonna be the story of every same-sex marriage movie i know exactly and you know anything that has to do with the civil rights movement for african americans in the 1960s right we get to the point of the civil rights act and the voting rights act and everybody's happy and it's great um except that what you're saying and what you're talking about is at that point when the success in some form is achieved that's also a potential sort of quagmire in terms of having a retrenchment into sort of the previous hierarchical structure um, because of the the potential for the the lack of need anymore for the the coalition that had come together. Is that a sort of correct understanding? Yes, I think so. Until the next moment arises, right? So that's actually why um, in my conclusion, I talk about what happens when the next moment arises in the two different state contexts, right? You see in the aftermath of same-sex marriage, the coalition largely dissolves. Some of the organizations lose a lot of funding, but then it starts to reemerge once the anti-trans bills come out in 2016, right? But it reemerges in ways that it's almost more difficult for the coalition to form because of the retrenchment that occurred through same-sex marriage as well. Um, Versus in Arizona, that case is, actually, I think, really fascinating because since the groups there are always under attack, they form a lot more quickly when the moment arises, right? Um, So 
the book ends looking, for example, at the Joe Arpaio campaign, which I think actually is sort of a harbinger of um, Joe Biden's win in 2020. Uh, in 2016, Sheriff Joe Arpaio was the, really this the architect of the I suppose the orchestrator of this reign of terror within communities of color in American, Maricopa County, and um, became this massive mobilizing force for these communities. And they successfully got him voted out of office at the same time that Donald Trump took the state by a, what was then a fairly large margin. Then they continued organizing the grassroots coalition they'd formed since SB 1070, and ultimately um, that, in addition to other groups, for example, the Native American communities in Arizona uh, really turned out in large numbers in 2020. Uh, but I also think this particular coalition in my book uh, helps contribute to that um, uh, Joe Biden's win in 2020. And and so. In this regard, I, I just wanted to ask you this question because I was curious and it's not tethered directly to your research, um, but you have a PhD and a JD. Um, and I was curious about how both these, this training, these two kinds of training brought you to this particular topic and, and why? Um, yeah, I guess, you know, um, I went to law school with a sort of as sort of like this naive person wanting to just, you know, change the world, which I think is why a lot of people go to law school, right? You want to go because you uh, can become an attorney and you can be like, I know, Atticus Finch, right? That's what every attorney wants to be. But then you go to law school and you realize that's really not what law school is like, right? It's not, and nobody is Atticus Finch. In fact, most people are attorneys for Walmart, right? They're like, <laughs> they're corporate attorneys once they leave law school. But I never wanted to be that. So in law school, I took basically all of the classes that dealt with minority rights. I took poverty law, uh, American Indian law, and I also worked with civil rights law firms. And I did a, um, a lobbying, um, uh, I did lobbying work for, um, a, a coalition in the Washington state legislature that, um, was pushing, uh, to get, um, policies passed to help homeless youth, uh, which had dramatically increased in numbers since what was then the 2008 great recession. Uh, and those experiences, um, I suppose really just taught me the importance of on the ground grassroots politics, but also how attorneys are engaged in grassroots uh, legal rights, right? And how that uh, it, it itself isn't something when we usually think of lawyers in the political science context, most things focus on judges and Supreme Court justices, right? But really, it's also about this grassroots rights um, uh, work uh, that's occurring on the ground. Uh, so. That, I suppose, really um, drove me to this particular project. Uh, and that experience also helped me make the connections that I needed to in order to interview people for my book. Um, and so it was really not necessarily even my career as an attorney, but my experience at, at, as in law school that brought me to this particular uh, research topic. Well, thank you for satisfying my curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate it. <laughs> um, I was, I, you know, I sort of just like, it's not that normal in political science for people to have necessarily a JD and a PhD. Um, sometimes yeah, they have I will, one, sometimes they have the other, but they don't usually have both. So I was curious. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I did them concurrently. I actually started out in law school and then um, decided to go to graduate school when I decided that I didn't want to do corporate law and I wanted to look at grassroots rights on the ground based on my experiences in law school. Um, and then I stayed with the law degree and ended up getting it because as I'm sure you're aware, the job market is not easy and I wanted a backup thing if I didn't end up getting hired in the job. And it ended up being a really good decision because there are, even though in the academic world, it's unusual, I think, to think of JDs and PhDs that are aligned on the job market when you're looking at public law, law and society scholarship, a lot of undergraduate institutions actually specifically want JD PhDs. Got it. Um, I did not know that. Yeah, I didn't so. either until 
I was told this was why I was interviewed at a number of places. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and again, more curiosity satisfied. Um, <laughs> so my last question for you, Erin, is what are you working on now? Oh my goodness. I suppose I have a number of projects that I'm um, currently thinking through. One of the ones I'm that I may end up looking at in greater detail is queer reproductive justice, which and a lot of that is about what happens post marriage equality, right? Same sex marriage uh, to these different groups that work so hard to accomplish it. Because you're seeing um, a lot of them have sort of declined. I live in New York State now. Uh, we used to have a big statewide organization called Empire Pride Agenda, but then they declared that they'd accomplished their main goals after they won same-sex marriage and they dissolved. But yet when it comes to things like trying to have children or um, other um, rights that um, uh, many um, non-LGBTQ people, I suppose, sort of take for granted, those are not secure by same-sex marriage. So we're starting to see a new coalition's form to try to ensure that these rights can um, be achieved. Uh, so my next project is likely going to be looking at queer reproductive justice and the struggle for that, um, which is also, if you think it's personal, right? I, I had a child recently, so it's growing, <laughs> growing out of that experience. Um, and that, of course, is going to my community of scholars who are interpretivists, who are really interested in ensuring that we select product uh, projects where um you're not going in and exploiting minority communities, but you're going in with eyes wide open about research or positionality. And um, I, I see this as a way I can contribute while um, achieving those goals. That makes sense. I look forward to talking to you about that book on the New Books in Political Science podcast when it comes out. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, it was it's really wonderful to talk with you. It's my pleasure. I had the great opportunity to talk to Erin Mayo Adam about her new book, Queer Alliances, How Power Shapes Political Movement Formation, Stanford University Press 2020. I assume one can get this at many of the online retailers. Do you have a brick and mortar store that has an online option that you'd like to give a shout out to? Um, Shakespeare and Company, I suppose, on um uh, I think it's on Lexington in New York City. <laughs> it's where um, a lot of the Hunter College textbooks are uh, sold, but also it's just an extraordinary local bookstore that has an online presence. Okay. So people can find it at Shakespeare and Company and any place else you buy your books. Thanks so much for joining me today, Erin. Great. Thank you for having me.